when you see archetypal stories portrayed in front of you, which, and that happens all the time. I mean, all the superhero movies that have come out later, later, lately, there's, you know, hordes of them. They're tremendously expensive to make, hey? Hundreds of millions of dollars, those things. It's like, they're all predicated on archetypal themes. You know, and I think it's of great interest to note that the most expensive artifacts that human beings produce, or at least among the most expensive artifacts that we produce, are precisely movies that are computer generated to tell archetypal stories. You know, and that's also the, the technological process that in large part is driving computer innovation because the most demand that's being placed on things like computer chips is actually, you know, recreating reality, CGI reality, because it's the most complicated thing to do. So it's like, what the hell? Why are we doing that? What's up with that? Why would you spend $300 million making Iron Man? You know, you, there's a profit motive there, obviously, but everybody will go see it. It's like, what's up with you people? You know, you go see some dingbat in a metal suit fly around in the air. You know that's not true. It's like, what are you doing at those movies? You think, well, I'm entertaining myself. It's like, yeah, yeah, right, except why is it entertaining? And why is it entertaining to all of you? And why is it entertaining to everyone? You know, there's a reason for that. So partly what we're going to find out too is what it is about stories that attract our interest and why it is, why that is. And it's not, it's not merely entertainment. It's like the most potent form of learning that we have. So, well anyway, so that's the goal. And during this as well, you know, I hope that you can articulate yourselves further and also come to some deeper understanding about the absolute essential nature of proper language use in, in spoken language and in written language because you, ba you basically r think and speak and write yourself into existence and one of the things that means is you should be very very careful with what you say because you are literally bringing realms of reality into being through speaking and you want to make bloody sure that the realms of reality that you're participating in bringing into being are the ones that you would actually like yourself and those you love to inhabit so you know it's a well I don't have much more to say about the course than that so what I'll do now is see if you have any questions so um, yes uh, I wanted to know why is the dragon bad and I felt like I liked him all along I felt like he was getting out of control when he got there uh, but I that he just wanted some attention, but I don't know why from the beginning we were building it up for him, for the dragon that he's bad. Right, well, yeah, you know, okay, so the question is, why is the dragon portrayed as bad? It's like, well, first of all, <clears throat> we might notice that culture, cross-culturally, that's not necessarily the case, right? So the dragon in the West tends to be something to conquer, and it's something to be conquered and the treasure to be taken. But in the East, particularly among the Chinese, the dragon is something that's positive. And what I would say is, and we'll study this when we get into the symbolism that's associated with, with reptiles, fundamentally, with predatory reptiles, you see that the dragon is actually a tremendously ambivalent representation. Because it represents, it really represents the unknown, or even more precisely, it represents the element of the unknown that you don't even know exists. You know, because sometimes something unexpected could happen to you, but you, you can understand it when it happens. But sometimes something unexpected happens to you, and it's so unexpected that you can't even conceptualize it. I, I would say when the, when the Twin Towers fell in New York, that was an event like that. It's really outside the domain of your understanding. And then there's, a, there's an ambivalence about that, because you don't know the nature of the event precisely. So the, 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 the predatory reptile, especially the treasure-guarding predatory reptile, stands for the potential that exists in the unknown. And that potential can be positive and negative, right? Because it's the source of all new things. But it's also the source of that which will destroy you. And so it's a very paradoxical entity. Now, one more thing. So, so the story implies that there's an optimal size of the dragon. And I would say, well, your nervous systems are actually tuned to detect the optimal size of dragons. We'll, we'll talk about this in great detail as we go through the biology of anxiety and, and disgust, as it turns out, which is something I've learned more about recently. You know how you can... Sometimes if you're engaged in a task, let's say a cognitive task, you can find it overwhelming. It's right, something you're having a very difficult time understanding, and maybe you even wonder if you're up to it. Okay, so you might say, well, your nervous system is indicating to you that that's a threat. 
And then other times you'll be dealing, say, with a cognitive task that's beneath your abilities. And so it's easy and you get bored. So then you'll be dealing with a cognitive task that, that it's like Goldilocks and the three bears, right? The temperature is just right. And what happens is that you have to grapple with the task and it pushes you forward in your development, but it also really engages you. So you're tied right into it. It's really easy to remember and understand and you make progress and it's difficult and energy demanding, but you're completely captivated by the process. That's the right sized dragon. And you, that's what your nervous system is telling you. It's saying, look, this, this amount of novel information in this domain is precisely the amount that, that you can incorporate while optimally transforming the knowledge structures that you already have without exceeding your capacity. And what that does, the way your nervous system signals that to you, is you get interested in it. You know, because you might, might ask yourself, like, why do you get interested in things? And you're bored by some things, and some things are overwhelming. It's like, you don't have any choice about that. It's not a decision you make, right? It's something you discover as you act in the world. And so, dragons of optimal size are engaging, and they push your development. But if they get too big, then they're too much. Could this, could this dragon not be the child potential? Like, I see an analogy between this and the story with the baby in the crib and the... Thunder going, hitting everywhere. It, 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 it could be that. Like the thing, about, the thing about that particular symbol is that it describes the unknown outside of conceptualization. It's pure potential. Now, you know, here's something to think about in relationship to that. I did a little TED talk on potential, which if you're interested in this sort of thing, you might want to look, look at because I, I, I got it right in that talk, I thought. But, you know... There are different ways of thinking about what the world's made out of. And you know, we think that it's made out of matter. That's the basic dogma, say, of, of, the, of the materialist realm. And I would say, look, it's really useful to treat the world as if it's made out of matter and look at all the things that treating it that way has allowed us to do. But that doesn't mean it's the final statement about the nature of reality. And whatever matter is, is pretty damn strange when you get to the bottom of it. We don't understand it at all, and we don't understand its relationship to consciousness. But putting that aside, we also act as if things other than matter are real. So, for example, we act as if potential is real. And that's a very strange thing, you know, because potential by its very nature is not really defined, because otherwise it would be potential, right? It would be actuality. But, you know, all of you understand your parents when they say, well, you know, you should live up to your potential. Or there's potential there. And I would say, actually, most of the time when we're dealing with the world, what we're dealing with is not the material world per se. What we're dealing with is potential. It's like what we're dealing with what this could be. And we're trying to realize the potential. And so another thing that you could think about at, think about with regards to the symbol of the dragon in particular, or it's the predatory, the predatory reptile more, more basically, is that it's a, it's a representation of potential. And so, and I, I think the reason that it takes reptilian form, and I, we're going to talk about this in great detail, is I think that what happened as we evolved is that the systems that we originally evolved to detect predators constituted, when, when, when we underwent the cognitive revolution that transformed the world into abstract representations around us, that initial pre predatory detection system was elaborated up into the system that we use to detect the unknown as such. But, you know, because it's evolution, the fundamental elements that evolved over the course of evolution remained intact. We're using the same systems. And that system has a language. And so the language is something like, well, the unexpected event is sort of like the snake in the grass, which is perfectly reasonable. You can think about it as a metaphor. It's, I think it's deeper than a metaphor, but you can think about it as a metaphor. And I would say, well, there are optimal sized... We have optimal sized adversaries. And I don't think you can live without an optimal sized adversary. Which is also an interesting, it's a very interesting idea because, you know, one of the things that people always ask, this is a very metaphysical discussion, is, you know, why there has to be evil and horror in the world. It's like, well, it's not clear to me that the world could be constituted in the manner that it's constituted in any acceptable way if there were no adversaries. 